the 4th of August 1914, Britain declared war on Germany. Britain, like several other countries, became involved in the war, known at the time as the Great War, because of links by treaty to other countries. In Britain's case, they were responding to a request for help from Belgium, who had been attacked by a German army on its way to invade France. Another concern of the British government, who had been worried for some time about the growing industrial and military strength of Germany, was the fact that if she occupied both France and Belgium, she would be in a position to launch an attack on Britain from the Channel ports. To commemorate the first centennial of the outbreak of this war, which we now know as the First World War, Tilsley creative writers evolved the idea of making a film which could be shown in the library throughout the anniversary years of the war. All members of the group were invited to contribute to the production of the film through various writing media, stories, poems, monologues, some of which would be factually based and others fiction. It is impossible for us to cover the events of the whole war in this film, so we have chosen to concentrate mainly on events in Britain and on the Western Front, from August 1914 until the signing of the Armistice on the 11th of November 1918, whilst also including some important events from other arenas of the war. We hope you will find our film both entertaining and informative. How the First World War began When the Austro-Hungarian Empire declared war on Serbia on the 28th of July 1914, it was the culmination of over a hundred years of hostility between the two countries. The origins of their mutual hatred lay in Austria's claim that Serbia was part of its empire and in the many differences between the peoples of the two countries in language, politics and religion. The signing of a treaty in 1874 had done nothing to ease the tension. In 1908, Austria annexed Bosnia, even further enraging the Serbians, who had their own claim on the territory and were now unable to use Bosnia for the purposes of exporting their produce, especially pork, to France via the Adriatic Sea. On the 28th of June 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, nephew and heir to the Austrian Emperor Franz Joseph I, arrived in the Bosnian capital of Sarajevo to inspect the army, a visit he had been advised not to make. A few hours after his arrival, both he and wife Sophie were shot and killed by a Bosnian of Serbian descent, Gavrilo Princip. Princip was a member of the Black Hand Gang, one of a number of dissident groups which had been set up by Serbian military officers. One month later, on the 28th of July, Austria, having asked its allies Germany for support, declared war on Serbia. Serbia's response was to ask its allies Russia for support. On the 1st of August, Germany declared war on Russia. Once Russia prepared for war, Germany realising it would be facing a war on two fronts, with Russia on its eastern border and France, Russia's ally, on its western border, fell back on a war plan known as the Schleifen Plan. This had been formulated in 1902, in anticipation of war with France. Germany anticipated being able to take control of Paris within a six-week period, leaving them then able to concentrate on fighting Russia who they expected to be slow to mobilise. However, the plan called for them to invade France by going through neutral Belgium. On the 3rd of August, Germany declared war on France, and the following day France responded by its own declaration of war against Germany. Germany then bombed Lille and invaded Belgium. On the 4th of August 1914, Britain, one of the signatories of the Treaty of London, responded to Belgium's plea for help and declared war on Germany. Germany had not believed she would honour her obligations under the Treaty of London, which they called a scrap of paper. Jolly good luck to the girl who loves us, oh dear. Girls, have you been there? You know we military men always do our duty everywhere. Jolly good 
luck to the girl who loves us so dear. Real good boys are we. Girls, if you like to love us so dear, you can all love me. Girls, if you'd like to love us so dear, you can all love me. I'm a music hall artist. I've been touring the halls now for whew, well over 40 years. I usually travel with my husband and my family, but I'm mainly based in London. I'm what you call a male impersonator. That means when I'm on stage, I, I sing and act like a man. <laughs> I do this because the songs they write for men these days are far more interesting and vibrant than the ones they write for the ladies. Anyway, two or three weeks ago, I had a bit of an idea. I thought, while we're in a war, why don't we recruit young men on stage? Because my shows are always packed with young men and ladies, and it's a good way of getting them all together. Well, the first time we did this, I was flabbergasted. I couldn't believe my eyes. All these young men came running on stage. They were so enthusiastic. I think they wanted to show off in front of their sweethearts. There were just one or two who wouldn't sign up. We call them cowards. But generally, most of the young boys are so eager, they'll shine in this conflict. Anyway, once they've all signed on, I'll get them to march round. I contacted my fellow artists, Mari Lloyd and Harry Lauder, and I believe they do just the same as me, except Harry Lauder gives 10 shillings to the first boy who comes on stage. <laughs> I don't do that. But as I said, I'll get them all to come on and march round and we all have a lovely evening. They'll all shine in this conflict. Here's the song we sing. Thank you, Maestro. Oh, it's all right. It's all right now. No need to worry anymore. We saw the army wasn't strong. Everything was wrong till the day we came along and then the band played. We all hurried, the guns fired a salvo of delight. We joined the army yesterday, now the army of today's all right. We joined the army yesterday, now the army of today's all right. Your country needs you, Lord Kitchener said. So I know, knew that I had to do my bit, like, you know, to join up to serve my country. So I stood there in the queue with hundreds of other men all wanting to do the right thing. It all seemed so excited, and we knew that we wouldn't be away for long. We had to do our training first then. It'll all be over by Christmas, they told us, so, you know, why not? I have to report back at 6 o'clock on Saturday. My parents were very proud of me and told me so. Well, at least I think they were. My mum went a bit quiet. Grace, my sweetheart, was really sad when I told her, but I'm sure that in time she'll be proud too. I do love her so much and I know that I'm going to miss her, but it won't be for long. Then we'll have the rest of our lives to spend together. I'm going to ask her to marry me before I go off to fight the hunt. Please, God, that she says yes. She's the loveliest girl that I know, and I just want her to be mine. Met her, Tommy, I think, yeah. A good lad. He's my youngest. And I know you shouldn't have any favourites. But he's mine. The older lads both foot down the pit. And I could have cried when John, that's my husband, said that he expected her Tommy to follow suit. 
If it's good enough for my dad, or my dad before him, it's darn well good enough for her, Tommy, he said. That's what he told Tommy's teacher when he came round to tell us how clever our Tommy was and that he would be wasted down the pit. I liked his teacher. He said our Tommy was clever and he was also one of the faster runners he'd ever come across. He could have a great career if he put his mind to it. We argued after a lot after, a lot after that, me and John, over our Tommy. He shares his birthday with me, you know. 21 years next. I always tell him it was a, the best birthday present I'd ever got. And he's probably told you that he's joined up. I really don't want him to go. But what can I do? If I say anything, you think I'm unpatriotic? He said it will be an adventure and better than going down the pit every day. And he said, and this was a shock. Go out and buy yourself a hat, mother. I'm going to ask Grace to marry me. Monday, 12th of October, 1914. My dearest Grace, I've arrived here safely. I'm billeted with two officers at the home of Mrs. Dorcas, but apparently this will be only until the huts at the camp are ready for use. Later on the first afternoon we went out to the parade crowd, but it was really strange because the men were appearing from all directions. Such a crowd. A bugle sounded at 2pm and we went into four companies, A, B, C and D. We spent the afternoon sorting ourselves out, finding out who each other was and what we were expected to do as a private soldier. There is such a feeling of comradeship and hope, but we are all proud men who can't wait to do our duty for King and Country. I do miss you so much already, my dearest Grace. I miss seeing your lovely smile that so brightens my day. Hopefully it won't be all that long before I see you again. Keep strong, I promise I'll take care of myself and come back to you. Nothing pleased me more than when you accepted my proposal and agreed to be my wife. My dear one, I love you so much and will write to you again very soon. Take care of yourself. With much love, Tommy. Dearest Tommy, thank you for your letter. It was so good to hear from you, and I know that you're well. I hope that the training was not too arduous, and that you will soon be fully fledged private soldier. I'm so proud of you. It's a very brave thing that you're doing, along with all those other hundreds of men. I'm working hard at the hospital, though nothing unusual has happened. Today was rather worrying though, as the matron suddenly appeared on the ward to make an inspection. We were all very nervous and she scrutinised absolutely everything. Fortunately, she was mainly satisfied with the running of the ward. The sister was a bit put out when she criticised some of the bed making, but it was easily sorted. I do miss you, my darling Tommy. My thoughts often wonder to you and what you're doing. I do pray every night that you will be safe. When you asked me to marry you, I was thrilled and I cannot wait to be your wife. I just know that we are going to be so happy together for the rest of our lives. Mother is helping me find a suitable dress and a hat for the wedding and I've asked Tilly to be my bridesmaid. You will need to decide who's going to be your best man. Hopefully we will fix the date soon and of course it would depend on how long you're away. But this dreadful trouble will be over before Christmas and then hopefully we can have a Christmas wedding. What do you think? Take care my darling. I look forward to receiving your next letter. May God be with you. With fondest love, Grace. Hello shipmates, my name is Jack English. English by name and English by nature too. I wish to tell you a short tale of my naval experiences in this war. Edward VII was on the throne when I joined His Majesty's Navy as a 16 year old back in 1905, 100 years after her greatest ever naval victory at Trafalgar. Then Nelson ended any hopes that Napoleon had of ever invading Britain and going on to conquer our empire. Now in 1914 another evil threat looms large across that narrow strip of water, the English Channel. The mighty German army and all its allies are seeking to rule Europe but, as with Napoleon, 
they must conquer Britain before they can progress. To crush Britain, however, they need to destroy our navy, which has ruled the waves worldwide since the days of the Armada. And I, for one, will not let them. In this tale you find me aboard my new home. His Majesty's ship inflexible. She was built in 1907 with the speed of a cruiser and the firepower of a battleship. We had been at sea for ten days when Captain Beckham at last holds our destination. It was that most distant outpost of our empire, the Falkland Islands. The German warships had been attacking defenseless merchant ships and our spies had warned the Admiralty that these raiders were about to attack that vital anchorage at Port Stanley and it was our job to stop them. As we raced towards the South Atlantic with our sister ship, HMS Invincible, we scanned the ways constantly for the periscope, which would mean U-boats were in the vicinity. When not on watch, we were kept busy by camouflaging our ships and practicing gunnery. On the 6th of December, we were advised to write to our loved ones, for we would not be home for Christmas. This was a most upsetting experience for us all. A day later we entered the anchorage, which contained several other British warships. Their crews lined the decks, cheering our arrival. This lifted our spirits greatly after our letter writing the previous evening. There was no time to sightsee this strange land, as the next morning a destroyer brought us the news that the enemy had been sighted, sailing towards the Falklands. Admiral Sturdy on the Invincible at once ordered his small fleet to sail out and engage them. We attacked the Germans head on, and their Admiral von Spee at first tried to run for the open seas, but he realised he had to turn and fight. The Invincible fired the first shots, and two plumes of water alongside a German cruiser meant that they were in range. Seconds later the Inflexible shuddered as we fired a full salvo. Invincible did likewise, and von Spee's flagship, the Shan Horse, was hit several times. The Invincible also suffered some damage in this exchange and I noticed other ships were engaging the enemy as the battle spread across the sea. There followed a huge explosion on the Shan Horse which in no time caused her to list to starboard and although she was smoking badly we still fired salvo after salvo into her. Her crew bravely fired back but this stopped as she slowly sank. We then turned and fired on another battle cruiser, the Gesnor. Ships were exchanging fire everywhere, but our fleet was in control, and eventually Admiral Sturdy called a ceasefire. We picked up what survivors we could, and as we did so, we realised that it could easily have been us in the water. It was a most sobering thought. We had gained a victory of Agincourt proportions. Only one German ship, the Dresden, had escaped, but that too was scuppered some days later. Four of their battle cruisers were sunk, with other smaller vessels, while we did not lose one single ship. The enemy had nearly 2,000 dead and as many injured, whereas we only lost 10 lives and a score more who were injured. It was a great and moving experience, and I like to think that old Horatio would have been proud of us. The unexpected high number of volunteers in the early months of the war meant that the workforce was severely depleted. A new workforce had to be recruited. In 1914, employed women were mostly members of the working class who were doing menial jobs such as working in factories or as servants. Despite the need to find workers for the essential industries, the government took the view that women should not be allowed to replace men. In 1903, Emmeline Pankhurst and her daughters Christabel and Sylvia had founded the Women's Social and Political Union to campaign for women's rights to vote. They had become impatient with the lack of progress of the National Union of Women's Suffragette, which had been established in 1897. Their founder, Millicent Fawcett, believed in using peaceful methods to persuade the government to give women the right to vote. The Pankhurst advocated violence. They and their followers were fully prepared to go to prison and even go on hunger strike to persuade the government to change their mind. However, once Britain declared war, the campaigning ceased 
and instead the suffragettes did what they could to assist the war effort. Their right to work procession involving 60,000 women convinced the government that women were keen to work in traditional male roles. Oh, it's from her, Kenneth. Oh, what does he say, Mum? Is he all right? He says, hello, Mum. It's been raining cats and dogs here. The water's getting quite deep and there's not much shelter either. So we're hoping it will stop soon. Do you remember me saying that working on the estate gamekeeper would come in handy one day? Well, it has now. I've been issued with a Lee Enfield rifle. It fires 15 rounds a minute. Not like the rifles on the estate. And because of my experience and being a good shot, they told me how to be a sniper. Not much chance for that hun, hey man. So no need for you to worry. Oh my God, our Kenneth a sniper. Well, he said not to worry. What else does he say? He says, as our sir heard from Joe, I haven't seen him since we landed. We were split up. Today we suffered heavy losses, but have little time to mourn them. We ran out of gas masks, so they told us to piss on our rankies and hold it over our face. They said it would be just as good as the mask, but it stinks. I hope Dad's legs getting better and the brakes even well. I bet he's getting on your nerves stuck in the house most of the time. You're right there, Sonny is. Must close now, man, back on duty soon. We'll write again soon when I get a spare moment. Give my love to little Lizzie now, Sarah. Hope she's old from Joe and that he's not gone missing. Please write soon. Can't wait to hear news from home. Look after yourselves. Love, Kenneth. Missing, killed in action, the Battle of Luz. High deep in hell, crawling through bloody remnants, fellow comrades blown apart, the stench of death, smoke and debris, raging gunfire, searching for refuge. Missing, killed in action, the Battle of Luz. Awaiting death at any moment, darkness engulfs my tortured soul. You do not know what Flanders means. Flanders means endless human endurance. Flanders means blood and scraps of human bodies. Flanders means heroic courage and faithfulness unto death. Missing, killed in action, the Battle of Lewis. Edith Louisa Cabell was born in 1865 in Norfolk, the daughter of the vicar of the village of Swardeston. She originally had worked as a governess, but then trained to be a nurse at the London Hospital. She had learned to speak French as a child, apparently effortlessly, and in 1907 she moved to Brussels, having been appointed matron of a new nursing school. Traditionally, nursing had been done by nuns, but the school was established for the training of lay nurses. Edith emphasized to her nurses the importance of good hygiene and had them wear dresses, white aprons and white collars, a contrast on hygienic traditional robes worn by nuns. She had returned home visit visiting her sick father when the Germans invaded Belgium in 1914. She immediately returned to the training school. She had not been back long when two stranded British soldiers sought refuge at the school. They, along with others who followed, were helped by Edith and others from the training school to escape via a series of houses to neutral Holland. About 200 soldiers, both British and German, were nursed and helped to safety. But at the end of the July 1915, two members of the escape team were arrested, followed early in August by the arrest of Edith. A secret trial was held at which she was charged with treason and admitted that she was guilty. She and four members of the team were sentenced to death Despite the attempts of ambassadors from USA and Spain, they were all executed by a firing squad 
on the 12th of October. Edith was allowed a visit on the night before her execution by an English chaplain who subsequently reported her patriotism is not enough speech. Her execution caused an outrage in America. British newspapers proclaimed her a martyr and the news caused another rush of volunteers. After the war, her body was returned to England. She was given a state funeral at Westminster Abbey and then taken by train to Norwich, where her remains are interred in the cathedral. My darling Tommy, I was so grateful to receive your last letter as the time between receiving each one gets longer and I got so worried. The mud sounds dreadful and the rats must create a lot of problems for you. How simply awful. I cannot begin to imagine what it must be like to hear those shells exploding in the distance. But you are brave, my dearest. You have been well trained, so you will know what to do. Life at the hospital is getting more hectic. Poor injured souls from the Somme are now arriving on our wards. It's a sorry sight. Some destroyed in both body and mind. We do the best we can for them. Some of them have a great sense of humour and they do manage to cheer up the ward. But some are just silent and too numb to even think. I look at them and my heart sinks because I can only think of you. I just want you to be home, away from danger. But I know that it isn't possible, but I pray for you all the time. Christmas was fun though, but even though I was working, we did our best to make it a good one for all the patients with Christmas dinner, singing carols and giving out presents that the local people had donated. The local vicar came and I think that some of the men really appreciated him coming and some found peace. Today is New Year's Eve and as the year ends, my hope is that 1916 will bring an end to this dreadful war. I know that here at home we are not being told everything that is happening in France, but from what we do see on the newscasting and from your letters, I do know that the conditions are beyond what I can even imagine. I do too miss you so much, Tommy, and despite the disappointment of not being able to marry last Christmas, I know that one day we will. My wedding dress and hat have been wrapped away carefully and put away, safely waiting for our special day. I also long for you to hold me tightly in your arms, making me feel safe and warm. Keep safe, my darling, and imagine I'm kissing you Happy New Year. With fondest love, Grace. Three blind men, three brave men, one blind man, one blind man, let's see how they run. Now where can they run? From enemy lines in the noise and the smoke, now poison gas and they start to choke. To avoid at all costs, a conqueror's yoke. Our blind men, our fine men. One blind man, a young blind man. Let's see how they run. Now where can they run? Tied to a post and a blindfold put on. A summary trial, defense there was none. 306 trembling boys they saw gone. Shot at dawn, shot at dawn. One blind man, one blind man. He thought that they'd run. There's nowhere to run. I'll wear the enemy down with men. Attrition will work, I'll send thousands of them. No thought for their lives and the consequence when the war is won, the war is won. One brave man. One brave man, this Tommy from Lee in the fields of France, found himself in a dangerous circumstance, pinned down by flak, then he took a chance, under great fire, through barbed wire. Alfred saw several men had died, failing to rescue those trapped inside, enemy lines, so he went and tried to save each man one brave plan. He dodged bullets and just got through, got help for the stricken from his HQ. He earned a VC at a place called Maru. One brave man, our brave man. One brave man, one brave man. He saw how it was run, knew he shouldn't have gone, went to war and saw the truth, that killing is evil, he needed no proof couldn't live with his grief, nor stay aloof, died with Anne, 
one brave man. Saw the carnage, knew his mistake, knew he couldn't kill, so for conscience sake, he and his wife an accord did make to thwart their plan, Shadrach and Anne. They found them there at the end of leave, arms entwined as the gas they breathed, their families destined to ever grieve for this brave man and his wife Anne. One brave man, one brave man, he went to church, knew the Bible said, Thou shalt not kill, choose peace instead. The lesson learned, it filled his head. For all his life, wouldn't use the knife. Arthur knew it was wrong to kill. Refused the gun and refused to drill. Joined thousands of others who had the will to make their stand. One brave stand. Three years he wasn't allowed to speak. A coward, a traitor, deluded and weak. His jailers taunted, but he stayed meek through all that grief for his belief. Three blind men, three brave men. Could it happen again? It might happen again. The men in charge send the troops to fight. Their motives are vague, but their speech is bright. How tragic to think that they have the right to waste more lives, to waste more lives. WPC Green, 476-2309. Report of an incident with the railway station, 17th of September, 1916, AM. I was on the first part of my duty this morning at the train station in Wigan. I had registered in at the station office on arrival with the duty officer who reported no incidents and a fairly normal flow of passengers. The weather was wet and it was a dank, dark day. I suddenly noticed amongst the black and grey of the umbrellas and passengers a uniform, a uniform of a soldier. The soldier stood out in the crowd and was shouting. Closer inspection showed he was not shouting to a pal or to anyone in particular but seemed to be in a state of confusion. His confusion rose to an almost fever pitch and suddenly he removed his rifle from his shoulder and started to charge into the passengers who were descending the staircase with his bayonet raised. I pushed forward to get nearer to the soldier. I feared he was suffering from some sort of shock disorder. I reached the soldier and managed to hold him back from the crowd who all dispersed very well all around him. It was now clear that he thought he was back in action in the trenches. An off-duty sergeant major came forward to help and we managed, along with the station duty officer, to get him into the ticket office. A medical officer was then called, who took over the situation. He thanked me and said he would get the appropriate help. At three o'clock the same day, and I checked back into the station, who reported and reported that the soldier returning home from, the Fran from France on a seven-day leave had been taken to the army medical officer. The soldier was sedated and would be receiving further help from the medical officer. Dear Mother, um, let me think. Dear Mother, as I speak, there is a battle commencing and bombs and artillery are all around us. I wish you were here. Dear Norman, it seems a long time since I saw that irritating grin of yours. Mornings don't seem quite the same without you. But I'm enjoying having the place to myself. I dare say you will be there for a little while longer. It's a bit cold here at night and scary. I keep thinking of home, and I have that photo of you and Dad in my breast pocket, close to me heart. Every now and then, I give it a pat. There was a photo of your regiment in the Gazette. I have enclosed it in this letter because I don't need it. I don't need reminders of my only son. I have a very good memory, and that's where you are for the time being, in my memory. We don't get chance for a wash, just a quick wipe over with a flannel, and I'm sure some of the men rub down below. It's not pleasant, mother, and I only wanted some adventure and to not see the world. You should receive a parcel soon. I have crocheted some underpants for you from them balls of leftover wool. They're a bit multicoloured, 
but they'll be comfy. Wear them, they'll keep you warm in the trench. But mind you don't get them wet as they'll shrink and tighten up. And we don't want that, do we? I'm missing your hot pot, mother. And I dreamt about your pea soup with ham shank the other night. It was delicious. There's not much for eat here. And my belly's rumbling louder than bombs. Drink plenty hot drinks. And if them other soldiers offer you a cig, refuse. And don't you even consider a puff on their pipes. Or you'll have me to answer to. Stay away from them and their vices. And I hope that you are praying regular to the Almighty because you just might meet up with him sooner than you think. So keep in his good books, Norman. We're all hoping the battle will end soon. And so far I've managed to dodge the bullets and the bombs. That's because I'm quick and nimble. I've got the prowess of a lion. That's what Joe Twig, our sergeant, said. He thought I was an athlete. How about that, mother? I hope you've been keeping up with the exercise regime that they told you to do when you signed up. They said it was crucial you did them regular or your legs could seize up because of that old injury when the cat that you cut the ears off bit you in the thigh. So be mindful. Tell Doreen I'll write to her as soon as I can. I don't have much notepaper, so can you let her read your letter for now? I'm thinking of you, Doreen. And imagining that pretty little face, always laughing and living for the moment. We'll go for a walk to Potter's Wood when I get back and sit by the brook. Oh, Tilsley seems us a long way away. That Doreen wants to write to you. I've told her any letters she can pass on to me first. I don't want that one to lead you astray just when you're becoming the man you should be. She's a hurl at that one. I've seen her and the way she looks at the men in the village. She can take a pick now that there's not many men left, so be warned. Feed the chickens regular as you can, mother. That's how they get to lay the double yorkers. And give them a little straw, please. Just now and again will do. I'm sorry to inform you, Norman, but the chickens have all gone. Killed, destroyed. A fox got in and took all their heads off. I roasted what was left and shared some with Martha Riley and her children. They've been good to me since you left me all alone. God speed your journey home soon, Mother. God bless you, Mother. And soon I'll be home and we'll have a party because I will have won the war. Love and miss you more than words can tell. Kiss, kiss, kiss. All my love, Norman. Kiss, kiss. I'm in a hospital in Nuneaton, in Warwickshire, near Nuneaton. I don't remember how I got here, but I was told I was very ill when I arrived. My last memories are of being in the trenches and shells exploding all around me. And and nothing. I understand I was taken to a field hospital where they patched me up and saved my life and then they sent me back home. I've got some oh, really bad injuries to my legs and my abdomen. I've told, I've been told, uh, I might not be able to father a child. I wonder what Meg will have to say to that. My lungs are in a pretty bad condition too, but because of the mustard gas, but they say plenty of fresh air is the recommended cure. My discharge from the army is on the cards. Thank God I won't have to go back to that hellhole. But I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. I want to get back to a hospital near my hometown of Tilsley in Lancashire. I hope it'll be Peel Hall near Little Old, and then Megan, my mum and family can visit me. I've only had one visit from them and since I got here, and that's two months ago. It's too far away and money's tight. My mother and Meg were heartbroken when I enlisted. I didn't need to because I was working down the mine and I was earning good money. But Lord Kitchener got to me and some of my mates and 
sent and got to sign up for a, to help the country. We thought that way would be a great adventure. It was anything but. I try to look forward and never to look back to the cold and filth and hunger and fear and filth in the trenches, but only time will tell if I can get over it. Go on, nurse is coming. There is a letter for you. Thank you. Words well, from Mag. I'm trying to open it. But I must if want to find out if I'm to keep on looking forward. She has heard me bad news. And she says as long as she has me, nothing else matters. What else could a bloke ask for? Oh, the other thing she says is, can I make an honest woman of her? She also says we can live with her mother until we get a place of our own. Well, nurse is doing the rounds again. She's got another letter for me. Yeah. You're very lucky. Another one for you today. Ah, let's see what this one is. It's a letter from the war office, and it's a warrant, a travel warrant to get back home. I'll be picked up by ambulance and transported to guess where? Peel Hall Hospital. You can visit me then. I'll be officially discharged after a spell of rehabilitation. I won't be going back. Uh, please, nurse, um, can you get me some paper and pen and then I can write to Meg and my mum? I'm going to make a vow never to look back. Just take each day as it comes and enjoy the rest of my life with Meg and my family. I hope I can do it. My dearest Grace, I write to you with a heavy heart. My mate Arnold was killed yesterday and I feel so low. We have been together from day one of our training, as you know. I don't know if I can carry on without him. We looked out for each other. He survived that dreadful fever last year and was such a cheery soul. He could always see the funny side of things and lift a man's spirits. A German shell th flew straight at us. All we all died for cover. When I was able to look around, I could see Arnold lying next to me with a terrible wound to his whole body, staring at me with vacant eyes. I have to admit that I froze. The breath went away from me and I wept for my lost, loyal friend. Reaching out to touch him farewell, I managed to retrieve his pictures and letters from home which he kept in his tunic. I clutched them for dear life and I promised I would return them to his wife. I send a prayer for him, but I had to leave him there in that godforsaken place. It was no place for a brave man to end his life. Persistent rain has made the trenches unbearable. It is difficult to move in the dense mud, and in places men have drowned where they've fallen into it. It is beyond hell what we have to endure, but we still fight on. But what for? There does not seem to be an end in sight. Eeps and Passchendaele have been mercilessly attacked over the past months. So many lives have been lost, thousands gone. There are constant shouts for stretcher bearers, and what seems to be a continuous stream of ambulances transporting the main bodies of poor injured souls. But somehow, there are times when I think that they are the lucky ones, they are out of this incessant nightmare. Sleep is almost impossible due to the constant shelling and gunfire. The whole ground vibrates and rumbles. Today is quieter and there are rumours that we are about to be moved on, but I don't know where. Marching anywhere is difficult, the mud weighs us and our kit down, so I hope we are not going far. Grace, thoughts of you are what keep me going. I reread really your letters as often as I can. I can still smell your sweet perfume on some of them. Without you to think of and to love, I don't know where I would be sometimes. You make this rotten life ten times more bearable. My eyes are getting watery now. Oh, how I wish I could have have you here to hold me close and kiss me. I love you dearly. I pray every day that I will be with you soon. Take care, my darling. I know that you are thinking of me and praying for me. Helps me so much. Hopefully our life together will start properly very soon. With all my deepest love, Tommy. Dearest darling Tommy, I'm so dreadfully sorry to hear about the death of Arnold. It must have been so hard for you. 
Keep strong, my dearest. I'm so proud of you and everything that you're coping with, despite the appalling conditions. Surely the end of this cannot be far away. So many families are affected by the loss of so many men. Many families are going to need so much support when it's all over. So will the men. Christmas gets harder to celebrate, as it does not seem right to do so when you and thousands of others are fighting for our freedom. We did our best though, for the sake of the children, as they don't really understand what's happening. I don't know how Mother manages to prepare such a wonderful feast, though of course, we have homegrown vegetables. Mr Roberts managed to provide a tasted chicken, turkeys in a short supply. The hospital is as usual inundated with wounded men. It just never seems to end. We tend to them with kindness and compassion. Some want to only talk and we give them as much time as we can. But it's difficult. My eyes are closing with tiredness. But exhaustion is now something I'm used to. In two weeks time I will have a week's leave as well as sleep, I am hoping to make some curtains for our bedroom. Our little house is looking quite homely now, with mother's help. Our wedding picture is in the pride place of a small table in the sitting room. I so long for you to be there to share it with me. Some of the girls from the hospital have asked me to go to tea dances in the town hall, but I don't go. I couldn't go without you. When you are home, we will be able to go and celebrate being together again. Won't that be wonderful to be in each other's arms and dance? I love you so deeply. This long time apart only makes me love you more, my darling. This New Year's Eve again, I send you all my love. My thoughts and prayers are always with you. Come home soon. Take care, my dearest. I hope your next letter brings me better news of your state of mind. May 1918 bring the end of the war, your safe return and a happy future for us. With my fondest and deepest love, Grace. I've never had such a shock in all my life. Three weeks ago today, six o'clock in the morning, I heard this loud bang and I sat bolt up right in bed. Oh, Bob's been shot! I cried out, he's been shot! He's not been shot, love. Calm down, John said. You've been dreaming. He'll be home soon. That was three weeks ago. And it was true, he had been shot at the very same time that I'd been awakened by that awful noise. To our great relief, he had only been wounded and not killed. He was a signaller and, and they'd been aiming at the, the cross flags on his left arm. Another two inches and it, it would have gone through his heart. I find it ironic that I feel relief that my son has only lost a limb. That's how we're all feeling these days. This, this awful bloody conflict has made us feel relieved that our sons have only lost limbs. <sighs> when he first joined up, he was a healthy, strong young man. He was pronounced A1 at his medical and strength sent straight to the front at Ypres. He's in Knapsbury Hospital now near St Albans. And I understand he's, he's going to be moved to um, Liverpool Alder Hay Hospital. It's a military hospital. I can't wait for him to come home. Be 
before he enlisted, he, he was a he was a manager at a gents outfitters in Blackpool. I don't know what he'll do now. It's 1918. I don't know how long this war will carry on. I just want my son back here, here with his family. He's such a noble, fine young man with, with a great personality. I feel so privileged to be his mother. Maybe a hundred years from now, my grandchildren will see what a stupid, senseless waste of life this war will prove to be. My Bob will marry eventually. And have a child, of course. And she will write about how I felt in the war to end all wars. In November 1917, the German High Command had met to decide on its war strategy for the forthcoming year. General Ludendorff was clear about what the strategy would be. No matter at what cost in German lives, he wanted to hit the Allies with a spring offensive before the American army had a chance to arrive in force. The first attack, aimed at taking control of Amiens and Arras, came on March 21st, when British forces based along the Somme were attacked. The Germans started the battle with intensive artillery bombardments, followed by an attack by newly trained stormtroopers. They soon regained all the ground they had lost in the Battle of the Somme two years earlier. But the British Army was able to prevent them taking Arras and Amiens. A second attack was launched on 9th April against the British Army based on Ypres. Although the German army was gaining ground, they had to call off the attack after three weeks when Australian and French reinforcements arrived. The German casualties numbered 330,000 and they did not have sufficient numbers of reserve troops to continue the battle. General Ludendorff's hopes of separating the British and French armies had failed. A third German offensive against the Allies began. The aim this time was to contain the Allied forces based in central France to prevent them sending reinforcements to British troops based further north. The attack along the Aisne River exposed weaknesses in French defences and their 6th Army was defeated. Encouraged by this unexpected success, General Ludendorff decided to advance on Paris, hoping to force the Allies into a war-deciding battle. In two days, his army was within 50 miles of Paris, but they were now too exhausted to continue, and the Allies and the Americans rushed reinforcements to the area. In September, American forces, supported by a large number of Allied aircraft, took control of the southern part of the Western Front. By now, the Allies were taking thousands of German prisoners of war. By the end of September, Germany was facing the likelihood of defeat. There was no manpower left to provide recruits for the army. Soldiers were suffering from illness, hunger and exhaustion, and many were deserting. Accepting the recommendation of his generals, the Kaiser agreed to request an armistice. Germany now stood alone, its allies having been defeated or negotiated peace terms. On the 9th of November, the German imperial government collapsed and Germany was declared a republic. Two days later, on 11th November, 
an armistice was signed at 5.10 a.m. and agreed to become effective at 11 a.m. Fighting continued until the last second, producing another 2,000 casualties. My dearest Tommy, I hope my letter reaches you as I am becoming increasingly concerned that I have not heard from you for some time. I realise that it's not always easy for you to write letters, but I pray to God every day that you're safe. Your job as a runner is so dangerous and I fear for your life constantly. Life here at home is getting more difficult. Who would have thought that we would have food rationing? All our, our allotments are vital now. There are many reports that some people are hoarding food and I believe that the police have raided some homes and people are being kept taken to court. It's such a change in life now. Women are being made police constables because we are so short of men. How our world has changed in such a short space of time. Life at the hospital doesn't get any easier. I have been promoted to a staff nurse, of which I am very proud. Sadly, the number of patients isn't decreasing, but those who do leave us are given good support in the special nursing homes. I fear that many of them will need support for a long time. As I am writing this, I keep glancing at our wedding photo in front of the lovely frame that Mother gave us. I am constantly reminded of the perfect day, such happiness. I am also remembering the rare few days of leave that you had and how wonderful it was to hold you in my arms. You look so handsome in your uniform. I'm so very proud of you. You didn't say much about your time in France and Belgium, but I know how much you feared going back to the front. Be brave, my darling. God has protected you so far and he will continue to do so. Surely this war cannot go on for much longer. It is more than any of us can bear. No doubt you and all the men are longing to be home. I pray that you will be soon. I love you with all my heart, my dearest. You are a very special man. I knew from the moment that I saw you I wanted to marry you. Being your wife has pleased me beyond belief. And I know that our futures together will be perfect. I am looking forward to seeing you soon. Take care, my love. May God continue to look over you and protect you. With my deepest love, Grace. You may have heard where our gym has been killed in action. A few days later, they got our ad in. CEO wanted to give me a compassionate leave, but I couldn't go home. I couldn't face me now. I would have seen Grace again. She doesn't mention Jim or Adam. I think she's scared for me. If I had gone home, I wouldn't have had to come back to this hellhole. They wouldn't have let me. But I felt I had to finish the war for the sake of our gym and Abby. But now, look at this letter I've got in my hand. It's the message that the war's over. Best news I've ever delivered. I hope my mum knows about it. She'll be dancing in the kitchen. <laughs> if they know they'll be dancing in the streets, I can just imagine it. No need to duck and dive anymore. I can run right across the field. Jump straight over that gate. Oh, ah! oh God! Shot. Got me in the back. Sorry, ma'am. Grinch birthday. First of November, 1918. My darling Grace, my dearest, if you are reading this letter, then I will not be coming home. This is the hardest letter I've ever had to write and I pray that you'll never have to read it, but in this uncertain future we have to be prepared for the worst. Grace, it is the thought of you and receiving your letters with news from home that has sustained me through these last four years of pure hell. I could not have kept my spirits up and my mind intact without knowing that you were my wife, my one true love, and that I would have a future with you by my side. We have spent so little time together, but every minute with you has been so precious. I've carried the memories of our wedding day in my heart every day. You looked so beautiful and I was beside myself with happiness. Grace, not only are you beautiful to look at, you are beautiful on the inside. You are the kindest, most generous person I know on God's earth. 
It is very hard to know that I can no longer be with you and it pains me to know that you will be devastated and heartbroken to hear the news of my death. My darling, be brave, be strong. Do not grieve me forever, do not be lonely. I will always be in your heart and I will watch over you forever with God's help. You will have received this letter with the Bible that you gave me on the day I left England. I have tried to read from it every day as I have felt so much closer to you. My heart is breaking now at the thought of you reading this. Take care my dearest darling Grace. May God protect you for the rest of your life. Thank you for making me the happiest and proudest of men. I love you. Always and forever. Goodbye, my love. Tommy. Although the fighting stopped in 1918, the war wasn't officially over until several treaties had been signed over the next two years. Most of these were carried out in France and each treaty bore the name of a Paris suburb. Germany, although not the first country to declare war, in the chain of events which started World War I, was treated very severely and the country was left impoverished to the point that it was almost impossible to recover. In the Treaty of Versailles, reparation was ordered to be paid by Germany, the equivalent of £284 billion pounds in today's money. Territory was also lost. Disgruntlement and hardship over the next few years festered and provided the seeds for World War II. Kaiser Wilhelm moved to the Netherlands where other German royal royalty and nobles joined him in exile. This ended the German monarchy. The Russians were involved in their own political holocaust which resulted in the shocking assassination of the entire royal family at Ekaterinburg, where the Tsar, his wife, four teenage daughters and their young brother were shot in a cellar. Our own monarchy remained intact, but significant changes had occurred socially. The rigid system of class began to break down. Women, many of whom had been in service, before the war started to feel their newfound independence and earning power as they took jobs vacated by a reduced male population. The fight for the franchise resumed and the suffragette movement resulted in winning not only their right to vote but equality too. In Britain recovery from an expensive war was difficult. Whole towns had been ripped, stripped of its male workforce as a result of putting citizens from the same locality into the same regiment, such as the Accrington Pals. Food shortage, much of it caused by the sinking of merchant shipping by U-boats, resulted in widespread starvation through the war and afterwards, especially in urban areas. The euphoria of the armistice soon dissolved when people realised the cost in lives and living conditions caused by this needless war. The struggle to recover throughout Europe and many countries beyond would take the nightmare take years and just as nations were settling into different degrees of stability the nightmare was to start again just 20 years later with the outbreak of World War II in 1939. Keep the home fires burning well that's what I've been trying to do over the last three and a half years but it's not been easy. So many shortages. Being on army pay and trying to bring up young Harry without a dad. When Joe first went to the front, he used to write long loving letters, but they gradually became short scrappy notes. And I hadn't heard anything for about three weeks until Monday, when he wrote to say he would be home on Friday afternoon. When the war ended, I didn't know if he was alive or dead. And I wasn't the only one. We were all so glad that there would be no more killing, but so many of us didn't know what happened to the men we loved. Now Joe was really coming home. I was so excited, spent the whole week making plans, cleaning the house and trying to make it into a good homecoming for him. When I told our Edna, she said I should let Harry spend a couple of days with her, give Joe and me some time together. Harry loves going to see her. 
I know she spoils him rotten, and it seemed like a good idea, so I packed him off. Soon it was Friday tea time, with the clock ticking away and I was waiting. Kept going through the window and peering up the road, but there was no sign of him. It was nearly tea time when I spotted him coming down the road, but it didn't look like my Joe. He looked thin and weary, walked with stooped shoulders, eyes fixed to the ground. I rushed to the door to welcome him, but it was like clinging to a shadow. He gave me a slight hug, a tired smile and slipped into the passage. I was wondering how we were going to spend the evening. Then he told me he had arranged to meet some of his mates down at the pub. Most of them were newly returned from the front and I hoped a drink or two with them might help. It was only about 10 when he came home and the first thing he said was that he would sleep on the couch. I instantly felt rejected but tried not to show it and I told him there was no need to because I would sleep in Harry's bed. So I rushed upstairs to remove my nightdress from the bed where I had been hoping for some sort of second honeymoon to break the barrier between us. I was woken by shouts and swearing. I jumped out of bed and rushed in to see what was the matter. But Joe was lying very still and silent and I knew he was only pretending to be asleep and he wouldn't welcome my interference so I crept back into bed not knowing what to expect next. He went off to meet his mates again at night and we slept in separate beds. I did hear him crying out again but decided he would prefer it if I stayed where I was and didn't ask what was wrong. And then it was Sunday, just before 12 and the back door burst open and Harry rushed in and he stopped short and stared at Joe. Who are you? he demanded in an angry voice. Joe smiled and said, I'm your dad. To which Harry replied, No you're not, he's away at war. But he didn't sound too sure and looked at me for confirmation. I nodded my head and tried to smile. Harry was still not so sure. So he said, He's not like your photo ma'am. To which Joe smiled. I stole a sideways glance at Joe who was smiling with real amusement and I wondered why I had been so worried about them getting on together. He put his arms round me and said, I'm sorry, it looks as if you have to suffer my nightmares, but I'll try not to wake you. On his way out, I told him it didn't matter, just as long as we were together. He bent down and kissed me as tenderly as he used to, and suddenly, I knew we were going to be able to work it all out. Loneliness is when I can't wake up to your smile, when I no longer hear your voice, your laughter, your sighs. Loneliness is when you no longer call my name, when life took a wrong turn and is no more the same. Loneliness is when my words fall unheard, when my thoughts are left unshared. Loneliness is feeling isolated in a crowded room, being drowned in my sorrows, in pain and gloom. Loneliness is being lost with no place to go When life has nothing to offer but woe Loneliness is when my eyes search for you relentlessly When I await your return hopelessly Loneliness is when he's living with mere memories A wealth of broken dreams An insatiable yearning that bears no end Loneliness is when loneliness becomes an uninvited friend As the sun sinks in the west, the night sky turns to grey. The country's flags are lowered at the ending of each day. Remember then the brave ones, lying cold in foreign graves. Victory depended on the sacrifice they made. The wars are just a pastime of politics for power, whatever they may say at the eleventh hour. Whilst people pray for peace, and vow not to forget. It seems the wars will never cease until the last sunset.